shares of Coinbase are on the move upwards after topping revenue estimates for the fourth quarter. Let's get reaction from someone who has a lot of skin in the game when it comes to Coinbase. Nearly 5 million shares in her flagship fund, to be exact. That fund is the ARK Innovation ETF and Kathy Wood, ARK Invest CEO and CIO, is joining us right now. Hi, Kathy. Good to see you. Hi, Julie. Great to see you. Thank you. So let's first just dip into Coinbase a little bit here. It does look like the results beat estimates here. It looks like they turned um, a profit that was considerably larger than estimated. Um, and there has been a lot of talk about the effect of the introduction of Bitcoin, spot Bitcoin ETFs, the effect of the increase in Bitcoin prices. What do you think uh, Coinbase is doing right right now? Well, one of the things that it's doing right is that it is, uh, from a regulatory point of view, the most compliant exchange out there. And it's losing all its competition. Last year's uh, demise of FTX was very important, and even Binance's issues have had uh, a, a, a positive impact on Coinbase from a, a market share point of view. I think they're also in the right place at the right time, uh, and they're executing brilliantly. The market is very volatile, so trading platforms benefit from volatility, and we certainly have had a lot of that recently. And then, of course, with the spot uh, Bitcoin ETFs uh, coming out, uh, we've seen the price increase or there's been volatility around it but now it seems to be breaking out the price and that's also good uh for coinbase so uh, a lot of wins and of course their ebitda was fantastic they've turned into profitability do you think that they will um, turn in a full year of profitability here in 2024 uh, of course, a lot depends on what happens to the market, but I do think the signs are, are pointing up for that. So, so yes, Julie, at, at this time we do. And I'm also curious, you said you, you find Coinbase to me the most compliant, um, uh, you know, in the crypto universe in this respect. Of course, the company is still fighting with the Securities and Exchange Commission um, over regulation of, of some of the securities it has listed. Do you think that they're going to that the company is going to succeed um, in its battle with the SEC on that front? Um, we well, we think the odds are high. And the reason we say that is because of uh, Ripple's win, Grayscale's win, uh, but especially Ripple's win and uh, what we learned about uh, securities uh, and and timing of issuance versus trading on a platform when something starts as a security and evolves into something else, not a security. I also wanted to ask you, um, I know that in your latest um, disclosure that you did lighten your Coinbase stake a little bit. I mean, it's still the largest position in your benchmark ETF, but I'm just curious what was behind that move. Yes, well, uh, Coinbase has had a magnificent move since all of the regulatory concerns were plaguing it last year. I think it's up more than fivefold. Uh, and so uh, w this is simple portfolio management. There are other stocks in the portfolio that are lagging. Uh, this has had a great move. And so it's simple, simply trimming, uh, you know, profit taking and really nothing more than that. Um, let's widen it out a little bit to talk a little bit more about what's been going on in the crypto world. And you were recently out with your big ideas report for 2024, some of the big investable themes that you watch. One of them is Bitcoin allocation. And of course, you're now also in the spot Bitcoin ETF business with the intro introduction of your new spot Bitcoin ETF with 21 shares. Um, but I want to zero in on that before we get to that. How are you thinking about Bitcoin allocation, how it will affect the underlying price of Bitcoin and, and how sort of normal people should be thinking about how much to allocate to something like Bitcoin? Yes. So if you look uh, over the history of Bitcoin, uh, the optimal uh, uh, allocation on average over over this time period has been roughly 5%, maybe a little bit below 5%. That's the average. Uh, when we first put uh, Bitcoin or got exposure to Bitcoin through GBTC in 2015, uh, the optimal allocation would have been uh, less than a half a percent, but it's it's been rising. And I think one of the things that we learned in the last year 
uh, that uh, that I think is encouraging asset allocators to think seriously about uh, Bitcoin is um, it is not only a risk on asset, but during the regional bank crisis uh, last year, uh, it appreciated as uh, regional banks were falling apart. Uh, and so it has become a flight to quality asset as well. So think about that risk on and risk off volatile to be sure, uh, but risk on and risk off, uh, that's quite something. And then the other thing to consider is institutions are, uh, by and large, have not allocated to Bitcoin. And uh, yet it is a new asset class and uh, they have to consider the ramifications of that from a diversification point of view. Uh, diversification into a new asset class that is not highly correlated with other asset classes, stocks, bonds, commodities, and others, uh, usually increases returns per unit of risk, which is what allocators want. Uh, and the other thing I'll note is uh, the number of Bitcoin outstanding right now is a little over 19 and a half million. Uh, the maximum number we will ever see is 21 million. So uh, this scarce asset is getting scarcer and institutions have not even gotten involved yet in any big way. Uh, and, you know, it, it's been interesting, the move that we have seen in Bitcoin after the introduction and appro approval and introduction of those spot Bitcoin ETFs like your own. Some folks we've talked to, including you, by the way, have said, well, maybe we would see a little bit of weakness just in the wake of that. And then it was a recovery. But the recovery has actually happened perhaps more quickly than people anticipated. Does that change the calculus for where Bitcoin might get um, by the end of this year, for example? Yeah, as you know, we do five year plus forecasts. And so uh, we're, we're focused on uh, how institutions and, uh, and countries uh, and companies might use this uh, new asset class for, for different reasons. And, and so we think we've just begun from a price appreciation point of view. This is part of a journey. I do believe that the SEC giving the green light uh, has um, encouraged institutions to think uh, carefully about it and have a point of view. Uh, so we're in the learning phase right now. And I think, uh, I think uh, over time that uh, this movement into this new asset class will continue to push up the price. Uh, whether it happens this year, you know, there's always, there are always short-term uh, causes for volatility. So a one-year period is pretty short, but over a five-year period, our confidence is very high. Um, and let's talk about the confidence in that spot, Bitcoin ETF, the ARC uh, 21 shares product that I uh, have alluded to a couple of times. Has already reached a little over a billion in assets, about $1.3 billion in assets, I believe. Um, the two largest products remain BlackRock and Fidelity's offerings. Um, you know, how are you looking at the competitive landscape now that we're a little bit into it? And what are you targeting for the size of that product? Again, I mean, maybe you're looking at a five year projection. I don't know. But what are your yeah. hopes for that? Well, it has been very successful and uh, we are very pleased to be number three if you're excluding uh, GPTC, which uh, has a much higher fee than any of us. Um, then you've got BlackRock, Fidelity and ARC 21 shares. That is fine company and we are very pleased to be number three. I think one of the reasons we are is we is our history with Bitcoin. We've been doing research on Bitcoin and publishing and giving it away since 2014. Uh, another reason uh, we think we're being successful is we have an incredible sales team at Resolute who has had to get its head around Bitcoin since 2016 when very few people thought it uh, uh, should have a place in a portfolio. Uh, they have developed confidence, they can explain it, and they can hold hands through volatility. And, and I think the other thing is our, uh, our ops, our infrastructure and ops uh, with our partner 21 Shares is, uh, is showing itself to be um, uh, 
very efficient, and you can tell that in terms of spread. Sometimes we'll have the tightest spreads in the market. Uh, so I think we're firing all cylinders, and I'm just so proud of everyone uh, who's been involved uh, on this journey with us. Um, Kathy, I want to switch gears. I guess we can't have a conversation these days without talking about Tesla, it feels like. So I got to ask you about Tesla. Um, do you think that the company should be, the, would you as a shareholder vote for Tesla switching its domicile from Delaware to Texas? Uh, we're very supportive of that. What what happened uh, in Delaware, the judge ruling and basically taking the vote away from us, the shareholder, we voted for that pay package, 73% of share, shareholders did. And to have the judge kind of thinking that she is reading the minds of uh, directors and uh independence, dependence, whatever, I, I just think, uh, as I said in a post on X, I, I think it's un-American, it's anti-investor, and it's an insult to the board of directors of Tesla. So totally supportive of that move. Are you supportive of Elon Musk's requests or demands or whatever you want to call it to get more voting shares? Or as he says, he'll take some of his technology elsewhere? Or do you feel as though Tesla's sort of being held hostage to that demand? I, I do not feel that. Um, I, you know, being involved in disruptive innovation and only disruptive innovation, we know that we need visionary leaders who will stand up to short-term oriented shareholders and uh, be able to execute their vision with the right technologies at the right time. Uh, and Elon, Elon Musk is the inventor of our age and he is also our Renaissance man. So um, I, uh, I, I'm always surprised at uh, the pushback he receives. And I do think that that 25, he's not asking for any more economic interest, it's a voting interest. And uh, for many of our companies, we are supportive of super voting rights uh, because we know the visionary leaders, uh, we go through periods of volatility and they just need to be able uh, to execute upon their vision, not be thrown off by, um, by uh, boards of directors who uh, who are listening to short-term oriented shareholders and swayed by them. Well, it's true that Tesla is going through a period of volatility right now. We gotta leave it there, Kathy. We will catch up again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie.